This is Amateur Logic, episode 157, for June 15th, 2021. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in amateur radio accessories. And by ICOM. Field Day is June 26th and 27th. Be a Field Day leader with ICOM. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tom. How are you? And I'm Mike. And it's good to be back. We've gotten to a bumpy start just a little late here tonight. You know, I don't know that we've ever done without a bumpy start, though. That's well, business as usual. Yeah. We weren't sure Tommy was going to be here with us completely tonight because he showed up in a green shirt. Yeah. <laughs> but it turns out it would have been okay. But yeah. I had my backup ICOM shirt here. I've had it in the drawer for a couple of years. Yeah. Close to it. It was hermetically sealed in a package. It was. That's why it didn't have that smoke smell on it from last time. <laughs> Good point, uh, yeah. <laughs> almost a wardrobe <laughs> malfunction? Mm, could have been. Yeah, we had a close call with that one. Yeah, if I had... Uh, had left the camera on the pre-show live stream, it would have been a major <laughs> wardrobe malfunction. It could have been an international incident. Yeah. <laughs> Worse than that Super Bowl. Yep. Ooh, uh-oh. Yeah. Well, let's see. Field Day. What, that's only two weeks away now. Oh, yeah. It is. What's the plan? <laughs> We don't have one yet. We yeah. got to come up with one, That's and it's more. it's got to be a quick one too. I know one thing: it's gonna be hot. Yeah, and could be wet. Yeah, it's a real good chance of that around here, as much as it's been raining. So, Emil, I guess y'all are going to the swamp. Well, yeah, there's not many places here we can go that's not the swamp. So, yeah, I think the. Uh, <laughs> The club might be getting into the swing. We had a uh, club cleanup date last weekend and going to continue the same this weekend. So uh, looks like we'll be possibly back in the fields of the club. Okay. Well, they have a plan, Tommy. I heard that. We, we should try that sometime. Yeah. Mike, what about you? Have you got any field day plans up there? Uh, I actually haven't thought about it much, to be honest with you. Um, That's in the true amateur logic. I haven't heard right any. There. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard any uh, local news about uh, uh, any of the other clubs. Of course, it'll be virtual, but um, I haven't heard of anybody else um, talking about field day around here lately either. Yeah, well, here in Central Mississippi, a uh, couple of the clubs that have done field day for years and years are not doing it this year they of course they couldn't last year either but uh the jackson club is not doing it this year and the vicksburg club is not oh wow that surprises me but i don't uh, understand that the samara club is they're they're doing it this year okay and so i think you know everyone who's going to a club field day event is going to drive over there. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the JARC guys showed up over there at that one, too. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Tonight's show, we've got a few interesting things lined up here. I've got one of these. It's a black box. We're going to see what it is and if it actually works. Sounds okay. You know if it works or not because we plugged it in a while ago. Yeah, I won't. I won't tell. 
Uh, okay. Those port arrangements sure do look familiar, George. Do they? Yeah, yeah maybe so. Kind of. That kind of looks like a raspberry pie of sorts. Well, you know, it is a raspberry pie of sorts. And you notice it's kind of shiny on the front. That means there's a touch screen on it, too. Aha. Uh -huh. So I've got a review on a very economical touch screen and case combination for a raspberry pie here. Yes, you can mark that one down, Emil. And... You'll just have to wait and see if it's uh, if it's actually worth what I paid for it or not. Tell me, right. what do you got tonight for us? Well, I had a little follow up for my short on the the almost free batteries. I've had several emails come in asking about the little battery charger, so I kind of did a quick run through over that. Okay. Uh, email. What are you talking about tonight? Well, let's see. You know, I'm always trying to find new tools for my official relay station down here. So I found a tool. I found another one. And I said, let me give it a try. And another ham and I hooked up, and uh, we gave it a try. Awesome. Okay. Um, Mike, I think, oh, wow, you're the slacker this month. Yeah, it's a <laughs> tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Well, that's true, and and let me just say, uh, the months that it's your turn, you hold down the position very well. <laughs> of course, I guess that's pretty much a tie, you know. Yeah. I wouldn't want to let the rest of the team down by not doing anything. <laughs> okay. Or, or by I, doing anything. Let me rephrase anything. that. By, by doing something. There you go. That is, works. Is this, George, is this why the north and south is messed up again? Um, you know, it could be. It could be. We're going to have to give this line a name right here, Mike. Whatever this line is. That's the uh, Continental Divide? No? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it might be. <laughs> All right, That'll well, be North Florida. <laughs> there you go. No, we're, we're West Florida and you're North Florida? Yeah. Sure. There you go. It's historically correct. Well, you know, anytime we've got a a show going on live, there's something else happening on the side as well. Yep. But uh, if we've got a live show going, we also have a chat room going. And you can join us at amateurlogic.tv forward slash chat. It's a lot of fun in there. It's uh, it, We have it for Amateur Logic and Ham College. During Ham College, it, try to answer along with the questions and then amateur logic there's just a lot of hijinks going on out there so anyway if you're missing if you're watching the show the live stream and you're not in the chat room you're missing half the fun i'm not gonna say it you're not gonna say it no. which okay what? i'll say it it's what? up to you to decide which <laughs> half i'll go ahead and hit the bone punch line okay email i think uh, didn't you tell me you needed to say hi to someone tonight? You know what, George? I I noticed something when we receive emails when the show is being sent out or or after you're finished, you know, the the live and then putting it out there for people. I, I've noticed that it seems to be making its uh, what would it be circulation either clockwise or counterclockwise down under, and. There's there's some people in the down under who are broadcasting our show and, and quite a few other ham shows mm -hmm. um, on their amateur uh, TV networks. And uh, there's quite a few. Uh, I don't know if it's a whole network of them that they have and operate, you know, off of repeater systems, but it looks like there's got a pretty good setup and they always broadcast. And I, I notice I've never talked to uh, VK7AX, but. I just figured since I saw those emails and going out, and we're probably gonna they're so, they're gonna see this. I figured I'd just say hi to them all. So hello, down under, and thanks for watching. And cool network y'all you guys have down there in uh, Tasmania in that area, and I'm guessing elsewhere. I just I don't know the full breadth of their setup. Maybe we could talk to them and find out what they're doing down there. Oh, that'd be great. Hmm. Interesting pointy mill. Yeah, uh, I know. Amateur television is real big in parts of Australia. Peter was mm -hmm. was into it, and they even have a, a digital repeater there. 
So I, maybe they do in Tasmania. I wasn't paying good attention there. No, it doesn't say digital, does it? There's actually, um, George, there's three networks. Um, I think I have them queued up on my side if you want to show my thingy. I don't want to show your thingy email, but I will show your video. (laughs) Wait, here it is. Wait a minute. (laughs) Wait for it. (laughs) Yeah, don't don't show my... It's a family show. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Here we go. So... That's the first one, which is what you were showing. Uh, Overstone, Northwest Tasmania. And then there's this one, which says Northwest Tas Amateur Radio Group. And then, or Spectrum Tasmania, I think is what that one was. And then there's another one, I think, called ATN. It might be chopped off a little bit on my side. Sorry about that. So it looks like there's three networks um, there. And anyway... Again, I, I saw it. I read a little bit from his uh, web pages and figured we'd just say hi. Hello, Down Under. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we all survived that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a close call, though. So you've been back playing with Vera? Vara? Uh, oh, it no. is. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Vara FM and Vara HF uh, modems, which is what they use on the Winlink system. But there's also a program he wrote called Vara Chat, which allows you to set up a point-to-point connection with another ham via HF or FM and then transfer binary files in chat. So, um, yeah, there's, again, we're always looking for tools to figure out if we can, you know, help relay or connect to somebody who's in or outside of an affected area, depending on which side of that coin you're on. Hello, George, Tommy, Mike, Amateur Logic TV viewers. In this episode, I'm going to talk about a protocol we've talked about before in episode 139, I believe having to do with the Vara chat and Vara Ross modem from EA5 HVK. In the last episode, we were talking about it using the WinLink system. In this case, we're going to talk about it in the context of being able to send point-to-point files as well as chat or texts to each other between two hams. So the designer and the creator of this protocol and modem is EA5HVK, Jose Alberto Nieto Ross, which I believe is why it's called Ross Modem. They have quite a bit of programs out there and descriptions of the modem, the actual HF modem, as well as Vera FM. Uh, modem and what it's capable of uses the OFDM modulation methodologies has quite the signal handling characteristics as far as signal to noise ratio goes and it ramps up and down with speed depending on conditions and signal strength obviously it's designed to work over HF but there are FM iterations of the program I got together with another ham and checked this software out, which we'll show you in a little bit. For you amateurs studying to be extras, like I am, uh, there is lots of information on that digital mode and digital modulation in Chapter 8 of the ARRL's handbook. I'm looking at the 2012 edition here. And the section is under Digital Modulation. And if you scroll down a few, there's going to be a section, or 8.3.4, because this is a multi-carrier modulation mode, which means there's more than one carrier of digital information uh, piled into that one signal, as you saw on the other page. It's There's lots of information here 
of what this is, how it's working, the fun behind it, the math behind it, all those wonderful details you just wanted to know about fast Fourier transforms and how to get multi carriers on the same bandwidth without interfering with each other and pulling digital information out of that. Even go, uh, there's even diagrams there. But uh, in general, the best description or visual I've seen of this is on his website there under the modem. You can see how those multiple carriers within the bandwidth arranged so that they don't interfere with each other. And if you have great signal conditions, you can have great throughput. I, I say great, it's relative. The speed of this is not uh, like anything close to our current networking speeds. But you know, when all else fails and you're trying to get a message out 300 to 1200 miles away from you, it works, which is the really important thing. As far as the chat goes, I was using version 1.2 Point five, I believe here when I started a test with my uh, one of my ham Elmers AA5 UI and we established a chat session between us it was relatively easy to set up it is a sound card TNC so I was using my ICOM 9100 via the USB the built-in USB port uh, as a sound card and it was cat keying the rig all on the same interface uh, for you for those who know what that is so here we establish this chat window the computer establishes and maintains that link between the two stations point to point and here you can see us chatting back and forth seeing you know this is pretty good pretty fast it just works we were varying our signals I think I mean power outputs so we went all the way down to maybe five watts which is the lowest the rig will go and we we're still the rates of the transmissions were changing, but the modem was maintaining that over HF. And it just worked. We never did lose the link or anything like that. The working part is the best part. <laughs> There's a little bit more with the chat here. As you can see towards the bottom of the screen here, there is some file transfer capabilities. You can see the send file option up here. And we went ahead and did that. We started with a text file that was relatively short. I believe it was a net announcement, the preamble, if you will, for a net that happens here. So I was sent that file and it achieved the rate of about 3,075 uh, bytes a minute, which is not anything great. But again, it just works if you need it. So there you go. We're sending files to each other back and forth I actually returned the file to him just to make sure it was going both directions so we got the files going between each other and you can see here how the protocol goes up and down based on the conditions on HF and how many streams it's simultaneously sending uh, during the transmission it'll ramp up and down as needed uh, the one good thing about this protocol now I'm, I am the cheap old man right I don't have the registered edition of this software so it does bug me when you first start using it to register it but the my Elmer a5 UI does have the registered version from what I understand it will if one side or the other is registered it will achieve its highest speed whatever that is based on conditions so they don't penalize you for you being not registered if you will is if the other side is and I'm thinking that's vice versa but I'll have to read up a little bit more on it so we send files we establish chats uh, we disconnected the link and reconnected on a different band we tried it on several bands and again it just worked it really did it was really something uh, we tried some very large files like a 75k file and we pretty much interrupted it it was going along but we, uh, we had some time constraints and just didn't let it go. But uh, binaries and text files, what you name it, it's going to do it as long as you have the time to go there. The software is, is free. You can register it. It'll, it will limit it uh, to uh, speeds if you don't register it, especially if both sides aren't registered. But it still just works. The WinLink system as well uses the same protocol 
uh, it's got an excellent from from my perspective. It has excellent signal to noise ratio characteristics, and uh, I I could see where at one point I was not even hearing the 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 signal. Somewhat like Olivia, if you remember the Olivia modes, uh, I could not hear or see the signal on the waterfall yet it was decoding the other end and acknowledging the packets or telling it to resend uh, that I found that was pretty interesting so it, it's obviously got some great characteristics on for HF use again not anything speed worthy compared to today's networks but when all else fails we have ham radio and some pretty awesome sound card based modems that just work great all right, 7-3 from KE5 QKR. Certifiable email. <laughs> Certifiable. Yeah, th there are some drawbacks to it. Like, it, it's only point to point, literally. One ham talking to another ham. It's not like multiple people, kind of like the keyboard modes. You know, FL Digi still has its place. PSK still has its place. There's many others, JS8 Call and others. But, you know, we're always looking to have those tools in our toolbox for when something might happen, and that's definitely going to be on my laptop. Are they doing like a TCP IP connection between the two, or is it some other protocol? Yeah, it's its own thing. Um, Vera is basically sending almost like packet george if you will it's not ax25 although uh it's a lot like it you can hear it sending ax acknowledgements and you know things to keep that link established and then when you're chatting it's just negotiating and sending back and forth but it's not ip you can connect to the modem the sound code modem over ip like from another terminal mm -hmm. to it but the protocol over the air is not doing anything like that for sure. It's its own thing. It's proprietary. Okay. Cool. Cool. I, I'm amazed at what they're able to do with just software modems these days. It's pretty amazing. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, the horsepower is there in the machines now, so why not? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Tommy? Well? You had... Uh, an uh, interesting I have, post here tonight. I have a, I think. Yeah, I do have a post. I've been looking forward to this one. This one comes from the illustrious words of the professor. <laughs> I only have one Amazon device, and it's not <laughs> even connected. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to boot it up, though, so I can opt out of this. But it, it's not so much for the words of the post as what it's about. Uh, Amazon Sidewalk is going to start... Uh, sharing your data amongst other Amazon devices. If you've got one of the ones on the screen right here, it's mostly the Ring and the Echo devices. So if you've got one and you don't want your data shared, maybe you've got a metered uh, connection or something, or you just don't like to share or whatever, um, you need to go in and opt out of those if you if you want to. There are instructions all over the place on how to do it. But, yeah. Uh, it's interesting that they're just going to kind of do that. And if you weren't on social media or stuff on the internet and found out about it, you probably would never even know that it was happening. Yeah, I mean, when I posted that, I was, I didn't think about what the post actually sounded <laughs> like until later. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. kind of, it's funny, but it's mostly about what the post was about, not so much about the post itself. Yeah. But it's good info to have out there. I'm, I'm glad you did because I didn't know about it either until I saw yours. Yeah, well, I just felt kind of strange that, they automatically opted you in to sharing your data. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have a metered connection. And yeah. Well, that or you might, you know, might be some other reason you don't, uh, you don't trust Amazon piggybacking their devices onto your network or I don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's good reasons. Well, it to, seems like there could be some security concerns with it as well. Yeah. These two guys here in the middle might know. Well, you know, if if it's totally in the clear, or if there's a potential for some hackery there, like like sidewalk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember years ago when the uh, major cable companies uh, tried to do that. Um, what were they calling it? I think they call it negative opt-in, opt-in, or something like that. So if you didn't, or 
negative opt out. I'm not sure which, but anyway, um, they were just going to go ahead and do it unless you told them otherwise, which I don't know how they ever got away with it, but, uh, there was a big uh, kerfluffle over that uh, when they were, uh, I can't remember. I guess that would have been in the, uh, uh, I'm going to say the mid-90s uh, when that was going on. But uh, it sounds like the same thing's happening now, but with digital data. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have any Amazon devices that, that are capable of using that. The only thing I've got are a few Fire Stick devices. Yeah. Um, and they're not, they're not involved in it, apparently. Comcast does that. I mean, if if you've got uh, one of Comcast modems with Wi-Fi in it, they've got their own hotspot that they set up so that other Comcast users in the area can, if, you know, connect through your your modem there yeah. and, and get on. I'm not crazy about that either. I'm not even sure if you can turn it on or off. Uh, if you put it in bridge mode and you have your own router, you can turn it off. That's what I did. Okay. Well, I bought my own modem. Speaking, so. right. speaking of the Fire Stick TV, I found something interesting the other day with my uh, Fire Stick TV remote. Um, it started complaining that the it was either out of range or the battery was getting weak. And I'm thinking, I'm not even pushing any buttons here. So how is this thing in communication? And I thought about that little Alexa button on the top, and I always felt safe because Alexa only woke up when you when you were pressing that button. But now I'm beginning to wonder. Yeah. Oh no, I think it's listening all the time. Um, I, I it something is because even like my wife and I were talking about the dog food and stuff, having to get different dog food for the dog, and I swear I was started getting YouTube uh, dog food commercials. Right after Absolutely, that. I did. Yep. I have, I've never no. seen one on there yeah. before. Oh, it's that's happening. that's happened to my phone uh, with Google targeted ads. Um, but it's listening all the just time. Conversation, then. and all of a sudden, the pop up ads will be what you were talking about a minute ago. Yep. Well, I don't know right. how they get away with it. I, I guess uh, you know, in light of everything that's gone on with uh, the biggies like Facebook and that. Um, they'll just pay the fine. <laughs> Bring Watch. back the flip and, phone. Uh, no, continue to Mike, steal your data. Mike, it's like it's like this. Agree, 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 agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have Did time. Did you ever to... hear about that? Uh, that it's kind of famous now. Uh, it came out a long time ago. The end, end user license agreement. It was for a uh, software game package. And in the fine print somewhere, it said, if you agree to this, we own your soul. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do remember that. The EULA, where they wrote all kind of crazy stuff in it. Yeah, because oh. they knew they knew most people didn't read the agreement anyway. Nobody reads it. Right. No. They make it perfect so long that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I don't have time for this right now. Well... But Don't go away. We're going to be right back because there's a lot more to go. The world-famous R8 now has a big brother. This is the Cushcraft R9, a 31.5-foot, 25-pound vertical antenna that covers 6 through 80 meters. It is lightweight, low profile, blends into the sky, 1,500 watts, full SSB, CW. Easy to put up in a single afternoon, and you'll enjoy it when you got weather like this today. Big Brother R9 now includes 7580 meters for local rag chewing and world band, low band DX without radials. Its omnidirectional low angle radiation gives you exciting and easy DX on all nine bands. 7580, 40, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12, 10, and 6 meters with low SWR. QSY instantly, no antenna tuner needed. Use full 1500 watt sideband CW when the going gets tough to break through pileups and poor band conditions. The R9 is super easy to assemble, installs just about anywhere, and its low profile blends inconspicuously into the background in urban and country settings alike. It installs in an area about the size of a child's sandbox. No ground radials to bury with all RF energized surfaces safely out of reach. It's very rugged construction. It uses thick fiberglass insulators, all stainless steel hardware, and 6063 aircraft aluminum tubing. is double or triple walled at key stress points to handle anything Mother Nature can dish out. 
It's 31.5 feet tall, 25 pounds. The mounting mast is 1.25 to 2 inches, and the wind surface area is 4 square feet. We also have the R8, which is the little brother, like the R9, but it, it does not have 75 and 80 meters. And this R8 TB tilt base lets you tilt your antenna up and down easily by yourself, so it's easy to work on. And we also have a three-point guide kit for high winds. We recommend if you mount it on the roof or any higher on a tower or something like that that you use the three-point guide kit, and that's R8 GK. Thank you very much for tuning in to Amateur Logic. We appreciate it. MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at MFJEnterprises.com. Some of y'all may know that guy. I yeah, know they might. Go ahead, Tommy. No, I was just saying, I'm, I do. I know him. We might, we might see him again if we go to another ham fest. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, you and I will probably be seeing him in... Whenever Huntsville is. August. Yep. August. August. Yeah, I'm going. Planning on it. Cool. I don't know where I'm going to stay. Well, you got any more room to back your truck, Emil? Yeah, I think George got a room, so the middle seat <laughs> in the truck is open. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, subleasing my room by the square foot. Oh, yeah. So, you get room for the sleeping bags. Yeah, yeah, maybe air mattress or something. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we can figure out something. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. going to be a fun time. I don't know. Haven't we blown up enough? <laughs> uh, not recently. Okay. As you say that as the smoke is pouring out from something. Yeah. <laughs> the night's still not, young. Yeah, not tonight. Uh, whatever it was, I think must have completely burned up. I'm thinking oh. maybe it was an MOV in one of these power strips in here or something. I just don't know. Never found it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Usually when the uh, when those MOVs let go, you'll know it. I had a a power bar with one of them in it, and uh, it actually left leapt off the table that it was sitting on, or the bench top, by about six inches when it went. Oh, wow. Oh. No, I can't say I've seen that. Man. Tommy? Suppose I had some, oh, I don't know, some repurposed batteries I needed to deal with. <laughs> Well, you might want to check them and see what the capacity is on them. Uh, check the resistance and, and charge them up so you can use them. Hmm. So I, I can uh, show you about a battery charger you can do all those with. Okay. For those of you that haven't noticed, we've re been releasing Amateur Logic shorts. They're only on YouTube, not on the Roku, not on Amazon Fire Stick. So be sure and go subscribe to our YouTube channel for those. But anyway, on my recent one... I showed how to recover some batteries and get nearly free batteries. Emil was proud of me for that. So on my short, I showed this battery charger that I bought. And not because of the charger. I've got other battery chargers. But it does have a cool function. It can revive a battery that is down to zero volts. Or a lot of them it can revive. And it can also grade your batteries. So if you've got one that's questionable about the capacity, you can run it on here and check that and uh, it's a cool little battery charger it's got a few little problems uh, it's not perfect but what is but anyway I thought I'd take a look at it and show you since I've had several questions from some of the viewers about it first of all it's the XTAR VC4S as you can see and it'll take uh, multiple different sizes of batteries you've got four slots and you can put in different sizes they can all be the same one uh, different ones it's got a micro USB cable on the end, which I wish it had been uh, USB-C, but it's not. But at any rate, let's go ahead and put some batteries in there and take a look. This is one I revived from, or I recovered from an old laptop battery that wouldn't charge. Here's one of my old AA batteries I used for uh, my camera flashes and stuff back when I was doing photography for the newspaper. And here's the AAA. And to round it off, I'll go ahead and put one of these little cheap Ultra Fire knockoff batteries. I got this off of Amazon. It's a pretty poor battery. Oops.
first of all, it detects the kind of battery that you've got, which is really good. This one shows it's a lithium ion, nickel metal hydride, nickel metal hydride, and another lithium ion battery. Let's take a look at the display. The display shows the voltage of the batteries. This scale changes based on the battery that's in it. So it knows this one charges up to four point something volts, so it's scaled to that. This is a 1.2 lithium ion, or I'm sorry, 1.2 nickel metal hydride, and it scales for that. It shows you the current voltage. Same for this one and the same for this one. We've got three different modes. We've got capacity, which is what it's on. We hit the button one time. It goes to current, so it measures the current. Hit it one more time, and it's got internal resistance. So you can measure the internal resistance of each of these batteries, which is good if you're curious about that. Now I'll go ahead and put it back on the standard mode. When you put this on, it starts off at zero, and it'll count up, and it shows you exactly how much it put into each one of these batteries. So if this is a 3000 milliamp hour battery and it was dead and it put 2000 in it or whatever, you, you can tell if it's pretty much a good battery. But if you want to avoid any doubt, there's a grade mode on here. So this button here changes modes, changes to grade. If you hit it one time, what it's going to do is charge these batteries up run them all the way down to what it thinks is supposed to be the dead voltage of these, which would be different for each one of these. When you put it on grade, it starts flashing, and what's, what it's doing is charging the batteries. It's going to drain them down and measure how much current is coming out of those. And you can tell, check that against the rating on the battery and tell if it's got good life left or not. And also, It'll charge it back up when it's finished, so it's good to go. The other function that this charger's got is storage mode. So typically the lithium batteries are recommended to store at about 50% of their capacity, uh, depending on the batteries. So there's a storage mode on here. If we hit that button one more time, it goes to store, and then it'll go through and either discharge or charge the battery up to the recommended storage voltage for each one of these. It's a really good battery charger. I wouldn't call it great, but it has saved some of the batteries that I normally probably would have uh, thrown out or sent to the recycle center. The downside of this charger is there's really no way to control the current that's going into the batteries, the how fast it's charging. So it's just going to try to figure out what it needs. And let's go ahead and put this back on the regular charging mode. Take a look at that. They're all charging at a half of an amp right now. Now this this one came with a quick charger 3.0 uh, wall wart, so it can charge up to uh, 3 amps. Let's go ahead and take some batteries out and take a look at this. And I'll go ahead and remove this one. We'll let, let it reset. And let's put one back. It might take a few seconds to level out. It says it's take, charging at 3 amp rate right now. Not too worried about that on these big batteries. If I put another one in, it's dropped down to 2 amps. The, the problem is that it does the same thing for these AAA batteries. So if I put one of these in, it's showing that it's charging at 3 amps as well. And that's too high for these batteries to me. If you put another one in, it drops down to two. You put yet another one in, it's dropping down to one. And if I go ahead and put the last one in, it's still at one amp. I, I would personally probably charge those at a half an amp if I could pick it just to keep these, the life of them up. But that's good enough. Because of this flaw, I never put just one or two of these AAA batteries in here, or the AA's for that matter. I'll always fill it up with all four. If I have two that need to be charged, I always put four batteries in there, even though the other two may already be charged. Just because they're there, it does go ahead and regulate that current down to, to the lower amount, so to have the less chance of frying your battery. But this, this charger does work with a, a quite a variety of different batteries and you can't see it on there but they're all listed on the back and I'm putting them on the screen for you now 
it's it's a good charger not a great one like i said uh but with all the different batteries that i've got around here i've got a wooden box that's literally full of different batteries that i've harvested or bought for different things i've had over the years and i've actually got some of the old radio shack uh, nicad double a batteries that i bought way back well it's probably been uh 15 years ago or so and i'm still using them i graded those on here and they still have good capacity left in them so why not use them yeah uh, the one annoying thing is that light gets dim after you haven't touched this for a minute but turn it back on you can tap the button there's been a lot of questions about the battery charger and i hope that uh answers some of them for you when you buy yours be sure you're not getting a knockoff there are some some uh, knockoff ones of this charger out you'll get a authenticity seal on the box and i think there's a serial number with it if i remember right and also be sure you're getting the one that comes with the qc or quick charge 3.0 uh, wall wart with it anyway i hope you find this useful and uh, answer some of the questions that you guys have had about the charger after my short go subscribe to the youtube channel so you won't miss out on some of the shorts that are coming up and we'll see you next time 73 yeah you'd never want to miss out on the shorts i got my shorts on right now oh i do too <laughs> Oh, man. One, one, one thing you, the, you mentioned about the Roku, it's not a, available on the Roku or even the, the Fire Stick, but I believe the Roku also has the YouTube app on it, so you could watch shorts uh, that way. It does. It's just not on the Amateur Logic channel. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah. I had to look at, I've got the, uh, the uh, two-cell version. And I didn't know that about the current, and I always thought that was kind of neat that you could cha charge an individual cell because, you know, um, most of the other, um, at least the nickel metal hydride and ICAD chargers that I have, I had to charge them in pairs. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they didn't charge at all. But um, that's, uh, that's a good point. I had no idea that uh, the current limiting is a little messed up on it, uh, depending on yeah, the number of cells really you put exist. in. Yeah, really exist. Yeah, um, you can also put, you know, if you want a one amp, you can, you know, you can regulate it by whatever uh, wall wart you plug it into as well. But I usually just put in multiple cells in there. And I did notice that mine's the VC2S and I thought, okay, it would be just a two cell version of what you have. But I don't have, you have a couple extra features on yours like... Um, the uh, the conditioning um, where where it drops the level down of the battery and then recharges it up to fifty percent for storage. Mm -hmm. I don't have that second button on mine. Oh, okay. So, just thought I'd mention it to uh, to folks that are out in the chat room and such if they're uh, interested in one of these. Uh, just be careful that you pay attention to the specs because the the two cell version that I have, even though it says uh, VC two S. Uh, as opposed to VC4S, I think you said. Yeah. Um, the features aren't aren't exactly the same, so there are some differences other than the capacity of the number of cells you can put in. Yeah, it's a pretty decent charger. Like I, like I said, uh, if it wasn't for that one flaw, I, I believe the VC4 you could actually set the current that you wanted them to charge at. But I don't know why they took that feature away from the S version. Yeah, I, I think you sold some of those, Tommy. I saw in the chat room just a moment ago where, hmm. who was it? Some, somebody bought one after seeing you. I know Chip uh, bought one. He, Chip, he sent know. me an email saying that he got one. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty good charger. For the price, you can't hardly beat it. Yeah. Just as long as you know about I that have one to, flaw. I have to ask you about your uh, wooden box. Was that a wine box by any chance? No, it was actually a barbecue box. <laughs> uh, came I got this nice wooden barbecue. box that used to hold. I think it would, uh, it came with three bottles of wine. Of course, the wine's long gone. Still have the box, and we were going to put it out in recycling. And I I thought and thought about it, and it's like that's that's too nice of a box to throw out in the uh, recycling bin. So I've I've got it. I was going to make a project out of it. I haven't used it yeah. yet, but. Uh, Yes, yeah, nice. This a nice box. Makes a good battery box. Yeah. Well, Mike, you had um, 
I don't know what you got here. Some some kind of topic that you were going to discuss with us tonight. Uh, on an event? Yeah, that's what it was, on an event. Yes. Um, just before field day, uh, it's that time again. We have uh, the June VHF contest that's happening on June 12th to the 14th. And the contest been, begins at 1800 UTC Saturday, which is uh, tomorrow, and ends uh, at 0259 UTC on Monday. And um, basically, in a nutshell, you can go to the site there. I've, I've put the QR code in the uh, URL on, on the slide here. Um, you can go and, and look at the, uh, the additional uh, rules and such, but... Um, Basically, in a nutshell, the exchange is is five nine in your uh, grid square, and it's uh, basically everything from two meters and up, um, and uh, even includes uh, digital modes now. Um, so yeah, you can check the site out for the uh, actual details on that. So you're saying it's a contest, and you give folks a five nine whether they're five nine or not. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of. sir. There you go. Kind of like field day where everybody's 5'9". Actually, you don't <laughs> yep. do that anymore. I remember when I started doing field day, um, you used to give a signal report, and of course it was always all 5'9s. And I guess they finally figured out that, hey, what's the point? So, you know, they're, they're, uh, they have something different for the exchange. And they've been doing that for several years now. Yeah, we got to come up with a field day plan yet, Tommy. I don't know the weather. It's it would be like going to the swamp if we tried to go to the hills now. Yeah, we we'll keep sounding like it's going to like it's been doing. The swamp's going to come to us. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much is. Yeah. Eventually, even even up here, I was kind of hoping they move field day to like October when the the weather's a little bit more. Seasonal ball. We've already hit um, 91 degrees already. Um, wow. I think it was last weekend we were up there, but um, and the, and now of course uh, you know the the mosquitoes are out. The heat kills off the black flies, which is good because if you get good cool weather, then the black flies are out and they'll eat you alive along with the mosquitoes. So it's kind of a trade off. <laughs> How, how's the property market up there, George? The property market, uh, yeah. I don't know. I could make you a good deal on some swamp land. Oh, you got some swamp land? I, I was yeah. going to say, eventually, you guys will be the Gulf Coast, <laughs> yeah. depending on hurricane season. True. True. No, it is. Um, I've, uh, I've already got a boat dock built in my backyard waiting for that. There you go. Yeah. I'm going to uh, have to mow the yard this weekend, and. I don't know. I guess I'm gonna have to get my wife's new rubber boots so she can push me out or get stuck. <laughs> you send her to my house? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're gonna take another quick break and come right back and I'm gonna talk about this. It's that time of year again. Field day is June twenty sixth to June twenty seventh. ICOM has the base station of your dreams with the IC7300 and 9700 SDR transceivers and the portable SDR transceiver, the IC705. Be a field day leader with ICOM. ICOM's IC7300 is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various stages to reduce the generated inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 is the radio that changed the way entry-level HF is designed. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. Bring direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. This all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy. 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time, high-speed spectrum scope, and waterfall display. 
smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. Expect top performance on field day with ICOM's IC9700. IC705 is the perfect transceiver for hams who enjoy what both the great indoors and outdoors offer. Features and functionality at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters, and weight is just under 2 pounds. See the IC705 webpage to view accessories and free software available for download. For more information on all these great field day choices, visit icomamerica.com slash amateur. Well, I promised that there would be some cheap action here. Some cheapness. Some cheapness here. And let me say, if you, if you came here for cheapness, I don't think you'll be disappointed with this one. If you've been watching Amateur Logic for a while, you know how much we like the Raspberry Pis. And I've got a Raspberry Pi 4B here today with 2 gigabytes of RAM on it. These things are very handy. I've also got uh, some of these with 4 gigabytes of RAM as well. They really work great. I like to look for useful things to do with these. And fortunately, these have been out long enough. There is a ton of software out there and hardware available. I found what seemed like a really nice device at a good price on Amazon recently. It's a Tredex 3.5-inch TFT touchscreen display. We're going to try it out today, see just how well it works and how useful it is. These seem to be available as both an individual unit or a kit where you can get a case that'll fit a Raspberry Pi 4 as well. Check in the rating. There's only been one and it was one star. Not very good. Here's the touchscreen, including the case. The ratings are a little better here. It's about 3.7 out of 5. Split between mostly 5 stars and 4 stars. That sounds a little bit better, and that's the kit that I bought. Now, if we look a little closer at these units, why would there be such a big difference in the ratings? I don't know. There's not really that many ratings overall on these. If we look closer over here at the photos, though, this looks like the one I got. It's got a black PC board. If we look over at the individual unit, that's not the same PC board at all, is it? It's a Tredex 3.5-inch TFT display, but it's not the same, or at least it doesn't appear to be. Looking at the sheet that it comes with it, it's 3.5-inch TFT SPI interface, resistive touchscreen. That's not as good as, say, a capacitive, but still could be decent for this. It's got an LED backlight, 320 by 480 pixels. That's not a lot. We'll find out if it's going to be useful. Draws about 120 milliamps of current, which is not outrageous. And the package includes the touchscreen, a black case, a pen, and a cooling fan. So that sounds like a good bit of stuff for $22. Looks okay. It'll fit a Raspberry Pi 4, so that's what we want. There's the outer shell, and the touchscreen just fits right behind here. There's a lip surrounding it. There's the screen itself. And, yeah, that's the one I showed you in the photo. This header right here plugs right onto the header on the Raspberry Pi 4. There is the bottom of the case. There's our little touch pin. Now, I did notice there's nowhere to store the pin in the case here, so we'll just need to know we need to keep up with that pin and not lose it. Here's a cooling fan. Uh, I guess they call that a heat sink on it. Maybe it's just a mount. And a couple of bags here. There's some sponge rubber in there. Some rubber feet. A few screws. And then some little foam pads here. I'm thinking those are... Those are probably... Part of the heat sink, 
Looks like maybe these are thermal transfer pads. And the sizes look like they would fit on the chips on here. So we'll assume that's what it is. There are no instructions included with this. And there's some screws and spacers in there as well. The case is for the Pi 4 Model B only. The description here says it can be used with the Raspberry Pi 0W and A, A plus B, B plus 2B, 3B, 3B plus, or a 4B. Looking at the only documentation we got with the unit, there is a download at lcdwiki.com. If we follow that link, here's what we got. There is currently no text for this page. That's not going to be very helpful, is it? Well, I did some more searching around and did find some information. We'll follow the instructions on this page. It tells us a little bit about the display unit. And although this looks like that model that had the blue on it, I'm not sure what the difference is between those two. Step one, download the Raspberry Pi Raspbian image. Well, I've already done that. And I've already burned it to a micro SD card. That's ready to go. We open a terminal. We can do that with SSH. Or if we've got other access to the Pi, we can just plug in a monitor and a keyboard and do this straight in a terminal. Here's the commands we need to type in. After you've gone through each line here and executed it in a terminal window, you've installed the driver. It may take a few minutes to do that. We're ready to boot the unit up. I've plugged in my power supply. This particular power supply has a little switch on it. So I'm going to press that and let's see what happens. That's a good initial sign. And after a little bit, looks like we're booting. It's a Raspberry Pi desktop that we're used to seeing. This one I've customized a little bit. You can see I've got VNC running on there and a couple of other things. I think the first step is going to be to hook a keyboard to this so that we've got some way to enter text while we're setting it up. I happen to have a handy Logitech keyboard here and a USB dongle to go with it. Now that we know it'll boot up successfully, the next step is going to be to calibrate the touchscreen. The LCD wiki says that we can use a program called XInput underscore calibrator and it gives us the information here to install that. We go to the menu button, scroll down to preferences, and then we've got a command here for calibrate touchscreen. And now we're supposed to press the points with the stylus. And after I get through without any misclicks, the program ends. And we'll see if we're any better off. Now that we've got it calibrated, I'm thinking it might be handy to have an on-screen keyboard. Because you're probably not going to want to plug a keyboard into a touchscreen. I found what looks like probably the best one listed along with instructions at Pi My Life Up. The instructions say first we should do an update and an upgrade on the Pi. That's always a good idea. That's going to take a moment, but I notice a couple of things here. One is the lines seem to be wrapping okay here. Most of them. However, down here on the bottom you'll see that that line is overflowing and you can't quite see the end of the screen. We get on down in the process a little bit and not having a complete line wrap there on the very last sentence. Yeah, I think that could be quite an issue. I just happened to have updated some other pies here within the last few days. And I know when this screen comes up, it's sitting there waiting for you to type Q to quit that message so that it continue on. If I didn't know that, I'd be stuck. That was a big update, but it's finally finished. And it only takes a moment and it's finished. 
And to get our own screen keyboard, we bring up the menu and go to Accessories and Keyboard. Well, let's see if I can type my call sign here. Well, I can. Took a little bit of effort, but I got it on there. Well, I don't want to save it, no, but I can't see the prompt to change that. Let's see if we're able to drag a window around on screen. Okay, we can. One thing I'll note here with the stylus, this is a resistive touch screen, so you've got to press down on the screen. When you do that, if the screen moves, it's not going to register your click. What might we actually be able to use this for? Well, let's try a couple of things. Let's bring up a web browser and see how that works. Let's see if Chrome is smart enough to resize to this screen. Not quite, because I know the X to close the screen is off the edge here, and I don't see a scroll bar. Well, after much effort, I managed to type in amateurlogic.tv, press Enter, and it looks like the website is coming up. If you absolutely had to, maybe you could navigate on that a little bit, since Chrome won't resize to fit this display. That's just a big bummer. Okay, well, that seems to be most of the parts. They went somewhere. If you absolutely had to use this, maybe you could. If you got the $22 and you want to spend it on one of these, by all means, go ahead and play with it. Maybe you'll learn some things about it that I wasn't able to pull off here. If you're looking for a good full-function touchscreen for your Raspberry Pi, you probably want something with a little more resolution to it. I'm not going to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I'm going to give it a, yeah, so-so. Oh, and by the way, the temperature is about back up to where it was. I don't think the fan did anything for us at all. There's not enough room in this case for batteries, so if you want to power it with batteries, you're going to have to do that through the USB-C connector down here. Oh, and also... When the Pi does shut down, the backlight stays lit and the fan is still running. So you'll definitely have to unplug the power or turn it off somehow. You didn't give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It was more like that. It should have probably been so sort of like... Yeah. More towards the south. I don't well, know. I, I'm, I'm learning it through the uh, artificial intelligence right now. And I should have a result uh, any second now. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> I'll have to agree um. <laughs> I've actually got one of those in my Amazon card I'm glad I haven't bought it yet so I'm going to keep looking I mean the screen's nice as long as you don't want to see anything yeah or if you're not in a hurry because like I say I have about an hour and a half worth of video I edited out when I typed my call sign in there that took me I don't know how many attempts, but it took me about five minutes to manage to get my whole call sign typed in with that uh, keyboard. 320 by 480 is just not enough resolution. The little calibration routine gives me gives me flashbacks of the little IPAC 
thing I used to carry around. Every time I'd let the battery go completely dead, you had to go through that calibration thing when you powered well, it back up. Let me just say the iPack worked much better than this thing. Um, yeah, I, you know, twenty-two dollars. I was thinking, well, if it works at all, and you get a case with it, but I don't know because I'm kind of like wasting a Raspberry Pi four uh, B in here. Well, I was yeah. thinking it might be good for those. Let's say if you wrote a package where you got some pretty big buttons and you just want that display, mm -hmm. you know, not the little small keyboard on screen on that side, but those big buttons where you're just hitting it for one or two, three selections, maybe that's probably what it's good for. I don't know. Maybe I'll figure out some use for it. I'm sure there's something you can do with it, like like Emil said, some kind yeah. of dedicated thing, <laughs> some USB <laughs> device or an Ethernet or wireless device possibly something you wrote yeah if you just needed something you could boot up and it would take its own course after that that would mm -hmm. be okay but it's just not enough like room. a pie clock yeah uh, just not enough room if, if you had a little more room there or a little higher resolution even this size would be okay if you had more resolution uh, it wouldn't be great but you know, if you can't find the stuff on the screen, it's, um, I don't know, kind of a lost cause, I think. Yeah, the more I think about it, thumbs down. Oh, you're already going all the way south. Yeah, down. yeah, I've talked myself that far. I just have to give up the 22 bucks, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... Is it still com compliant? Is it? Um, did, you, did I hear you say $22? Yep. Yep, including the case. Yeah, but not the Pi 4. Not the Pi 4, but you did mm -hmm. get a fan in there and some little blue spongy pads. I don't know. I think Tommy's got it this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I I ran the Pi with no heat sinks there while I was setting all of this up, and I had it, you know, set where I could see what the temperature was, and uh, then I put the fan on, and it didn't make a bit of difference. I mean, it was exactly the same thing. So it does vibrate nicely and makes a nice buzzing sound. Yeah, it also almost had that gyroscope effect. You could kind of, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> yeah, when you moved it around, you could kind of feel it working against you. No, knowing how Tommy digs those batteries out of packs like he did, man, he's on the, he's on the cheap list. <laughs> well, he is. Unfortunately, he can't put any of those batteries in here. There's not room no, for No, I can tape some to the side of it. <laughs> there you, you could. <laughs> it might be a waste of... piece of gum off of that bottle over there. <laughs> yeah. It, it might be a waste of uh, good repurposed batteries, but... Anyway, I had... Uh, an email here from my friend Jocelyn. I don't know if he's in the chat room there tonight. KD5VRX or VA2VRX. I don't uh, see him tonight. Uh, I don't see them. He's in there sometimes. Uh, he sent me an email. He said, I hope you and the crew are well. Not sure if you heard about this project concerning the new development under the WLW Tower. He'd like to know my thoughts on it, uh, specifically with the FCC RF exposure rules uh, released on May the 3rd. And he assumes there are similar rules that would apply for this since it's still RF. It seems that it's a little close for 50 kilowatts power, but at least, you know, it wouldn't be 500 kilowatts like it was in the 30s. And he hopes to make it to Huntsville this year, but not sure yet. He's got a room booked, but it's possible that might be Chris's move-in date for mm -hmm. college. Can you believe he's going mm. to college Wow! already? Yep. So, yeah, that's it right there. You can see the where the tower is sitting there, and they're going to build, I've forgotten what they call it now, a shopping area, some kind of, um, strip mall or something. I don't know. They're not straight in a row, but 
they're going to put a lot of businesses right there under that 50 kilowatt tower. Um, mm. Let me just oh. say, legally, yeah, they probably can do that because there are RFR rules concerning it. They didn't change for broadcasting on May the 3rd, though. Um, they, they've been in place for a long time. And it's the same as amateur radio. It's based on the amount of exposure and the RF level as well. And I'm sure someone sat down and calculated it all out that, yeah, it would be legal that you could put people in these buildings this uh, distance away and you would be okay legally. But uh, just from personal experience, uh, I think it's probably a bad idea. Because you're going to have so many problems with RFR there. Your telephone system's going to be just <laughs> full of it. And I kind of speak from experience because I got a 50 kilowatt AM and there's you know, nothing within at least a mile of it. And you still get complaints with people, you know, it's interfering with their appliances and things. So. Is it on Beasley Road? No, not that. It's just five kilowatt over there. Well, that one used to come in my at least, telephone. At least they'll all yeah. have music on hold. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it's been maybe a talk station these and days. Music from your microwave. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they can probably make it work, but there are going to be some interference problems to them to some devices in those buildings, I would suspect. They've done something similar to that in Atlanta around the uh, WSB Tower. Really? Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly what it is they put there, but they built something around it, and I can, I don't know. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Plus, you got a tower that's been in the air for... I don't know how many years. I don't know what year they built that tower, but you know it's been there since the 1930s. Eventually, that thing's going to come down. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be up oh, under wow. it. That's a lot of metal. So, Anyway, Jocelyn, thanks for the email there. And, yeah, we've, we've heard of this story, but um, just... I hadn't looked at it recently, and I noticed on those plans that we showed a moment ago, they've changed some of the things, what's going to be in what areas there. So, I don't know. Uh, I did see where there was a backhoe there, so maybe they're going to do something. I think that falls under the just because you can doesn't mean you should rule. Uh, I think so. And where it's located, I don't think there's a shortage of real estate there, so... No, nah, there's a lot of, yeah. well, at least last time I was there, there was a lot of open space around there. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think that's an issue. It's just... Uh, Probably because it's right there at that historic site. Yeah, well, that's, I would think, yeah, yeah that's why. Proximity. Okay, well, I guess that's going to do it for tonight's show. Got a full one there, and a couple of things we want to mention... On the way out, if you happen to show up at a green screen shoot wearing a green shirt, make sure it's the right shade of green because it will work. <laughs> yeah. What is that? Not Your non key green? Your peace crew shirt is just fine. I'll have to remember that so I can wear it. But say if it was more of a a lighter color green than that, and you needed some other wardrobe. Well, now you, you couldn't get it just like that, but you could get it fairly quick. Fairly quick, if you thought about it in advance. Where would you go, Tommy, to get you a green shirt to disappear in? Oh, you know, I would probably go to the place you got on the screen right here shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash amateur logic. They got some pretty cool stuff there at that place. I know for a fact they do. They got uh, T-shirts, caps. Some of the caps you can get them even without the dog teeth marks on them, like Emil's has. <laughs> uh, cups, mugs, backpacks, pretty much 
well there's a lot of stuff on there so anyway if you want some swag go check it out at shop.amateurlogic. or i'm sorry shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash amateur logic well we started doing a new series of short videos here on the week so we don't have an amateur logic or a ham college posting We've got Amateur Logic shorts now. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, Tommy? I've got mine on right here. Oh, oh, you changed the camera so you can't see them. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for everybody out there. So we we release Amateur Logic uh, one week. It's usually around the fifteenth of the month, and Ham College is at the end of the month. So there's a lot of weeks in there that we don't have something coming out. So we decided to fill those empty spots. So to do that, we've been releasing Amateur Logic shorts. Uh, I did one on the batteries I mentioned earlier. Emil's done one on uh, Wi-Fi, optimizing your Wi-Fi. Mike's done uh, one on the SDR stuff, I believe. He's quite a few of them and a lot of informative stuff, so go check them out. They're not released on the normal channels. They're not on the Roku app, on our Roku app. They're not on our Amazon Fire Stick app. Uh, you can see them through YouTube, though, so you really should go subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification button so you can get notified when they get released so you don't miss them. Yep. And another activity going on every Tuesday night here, we've got a net. It's an Amateur Logic Soundcheck net. It's a multi-mode digital net. You can do Echo Link, uh, P25, All-Star, D-Star, DMR, Brandmeister or TGIF. Yeah, we got a graphic for it, too. Yep. We do have a graphic, and it's a lot easier to see, isn't it? <laughs> Amtrak Hotline, System Fusion, Wires X, and XDN, M17. So any of those modes, you can try one or more of or them. Or all of the modes. Or all of them. And our net controls, well, um, you know, often a lot of them are hanging out in the chat room over here. And I did see Amanda was in there a little yeah. earlier. I was yeah. still in there. Yeah, Amanda's Marty. in there. Marty's in there. Yeah. So, um, you know, we rotate net controls. There's a different pair of folks every week calling the nets. And it's always a lot of fun. So join us if you're looking for something to do Tuesday night. A lot of ways to do it there. Yep, yeah, started out when the COVID stuff happened and everybody got locked down. And we were going to do that for a few weeks, and we recently had the 60th net and still going. So it's a lot of fun, so come check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, and throughout the month, if you'd like to check in with our social media groups, you can do that at facebook.com slash group slash amateurlogic.tv or... Or uh, follow us on, at, at Amateur Logic on Twitter. Or mewe.com slash join slash Amateur Logic TV. Or groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic. You know that. Or. And we also have an Instagram group that never makes it to the list. I will say it's not very active, but I do post to it when we go to Hamfest and do field day outings things like that um so anyway yeah so nothing were you hoping that i was going to say google plus email <laughs> no i was going to say i was just keeping continuing what george was doing or well or was, this was getting boolean i was and thinking then? it was nice that we've only got four of them or else it would uh would have got out of kilter right there well that is true Ooh, that was an or else statement it was <laughs> Elsor. Elsor. Yeah. Uh, it's too bad I don't have a nerd alert icon that yeah. I can throw up on Nerds. my screen. Yeah. Well, Elsif. Yeah, if it was more than that, we'd have to select case or something. Oh. Switch. Oh. Switch. Yep. These and guys. We've got a wiki. We do have a wiki. There's the URL right there, amateurlogic.tv forward slash wiki. If you want to know what's in one of the shows, that's the place to find it. If yeah. you email us and ask, hey, hey, Tommy, what show was so-and-so in? That's where I go look, so you can save yourself some time and go look there yourself. Yep. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, we have a wicked wiki master. <laughs> 
sitting right here. Uh, Tommy's been doing our wiki now for, I don't know, uh, a while. Out? Yeah, I don't know how long. Yep. Probably a year, maybe. Probably a year, maybe. <laughs> Sounds about right to me. Well, before we get out of here, any final thoughts for tonight, Tommy? What do you think? Nope. Uh, looking forward to field day, whatever that looks like. And uh, we'll figure it out when we get there, like we usually do. Yep. Email. Keep it cheap. <laughs> Keep it cheap. Those are great words. Words of wisdom. All right. Mike. Well, let me just say it's been a pleasure doing nothing for you uh, <laughs> this episode. Yeah. Although I was I was tempted to say this month, but I did do the last short last week, so that was a pretty fun one on Windows 10 Sandbox. So. Oh yeah, I should. And incidentally, uh, there was a comment about it uh, regarding um, the home edition of Windows 10 not supporting Windows Sandbox. I posted a link in the chat on YouTube, um, and it'll take you to a page and show you, shows you what you can do to get it to run on Home Edition. Oh, okay. Oh, and awesome. In case you hadn't watched that Amateur Logic short, Mike discovered Windows Sandbox. And email, it's, it's free. Uh, I saw that. I installed it watching his video. I installed it. I got it for nothing. Yep. <laughs> Um, it is pretty cool. You know, I, I knew it was there, but I never really thought to investigate it much. Yeah. And, and honestly, for the kind of work I do, I should have done it a long time ago. Well, yeah, you know, I've thought about it before. I, you know, maybe, well, I used to keep an old virtual machine hanging around just so I could go destroy it. And now you can, whether you blow it up or not, testing out something, you can blow it up when you're done with it. Yeah. But I, I, at work, I have servers, uh, just spare development servers. Yeah. That's what I test on. But I, I, I need to get set up and use that. Yeah. So go check it out on the Amateur Logic YouTube page there or channel. That's what we call it. Learn more about it. Yeah, it was a good one, Mike. Yep. And yeah. let me say, you did an excellent job tonight, Mike. You made us all proud. Well, I was I was confused. I thought it was Ham College night, so I was yeah. prepared not to do anything. You didn't wake me up. That's okay. At Ham College, uh, last Ham College, I wore my Amateur Logic shirt. Uh, email, I think he was soliciting beads there. <laughs> oh, no, that was a Mardi Gras move, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't want to lower the ratings. <laughs> Is that even possible? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thanks for being uh, here. <laughs> thanks for being here tonight, everyone. Uh, we had a great time and hope you did too. Seven three. Seven three. Seven three. Seven three. It's a. Let me just say it's cheap. It's very Whoa. cheap. Do you see his ears perk up? Yep, <laughs> I did. Those those headphones just kind of went uh -huh. like that. You know? <laughs>